We'll try. Yeah. Okay. Good luck, doctor. Thank you very yeah. much. Elena is fine. You don't have to be so formal. <laughs> <laughs> I go by Elena. It just, you know, sometimes Elena. people like to know my educational background, but I yeah, we are live. So Bala, you and uh, Dr. Rao on the spotlight. Okay, good luck, doctor. Okay, great. Yeah. Elena is fine. You don't have to be so formal. Vanakkam. Amude Tamile Arekiya Mulie Enadugire. Today we have with us Dr. Elena Polonova. Uh, this is uh, part of the New York Tamil Changam series on helping the community, our community, our students, and our younger generation. Dr. Elena Polonova is a professional psychologist who has been working in the field of higher education for 20 years. Her experience includes admissions for competitive colleges, honors programs, career counseling, and teaching. Through counseling hundreds of students on their choice of college, major, and career, Dr. Polenova has gained insight into the key factors contributing to students' success in the context of their family backgrounds and aspirations. Her insider's knowledge of the academic landscape and college admissions process is underscored by her personal experience of helping three of her own children through the process. And into Williams, Yale and, Yale and Honors College at Stony Brook University. Dr. Polenova leads her own consult consulting firm called Polenova Consulting. She has served on the advisory board and admission committee for Honors College at Stony Brook University and she is certified in personality and career assessments. And New York Tamil Changam is very proud to have an eminent person who's also a hands-on in the admissions process, which can be very tedious to navigate for first-time college students. And here's the floor, Dr. Palenova. Okay, thank you very much for the wonderful introduction and thank you very much for having me. I'm really excited to be here tonight with everybody and I will do my best to uh, demystify this very complicated and on, honestly convoluted process. So let me share my screen, yes, and we can start. Is it good? Yes, it's good. Can you see that? Can everybody see that? Yes. So I can just go ahead, yes? Yeah, let's go right to it. <laughs> okay. So, um, wait a second. It doesn't want to scroll. Next. Okay, I mean, I had the slide about me because I didn't know that uh, I will have such a wonderful introduction. So I'm just gonna add a couple things. I am an immigrant, first generation, as probably many of you, of your families too. So I had to learn the system when I came in. And I feel that my thorough knowledge of the system initially came from the fact that I didn't understand that and I hate not understanding things and I became really obsessed with understanding every detail and then I spent 20 years working there so um give me one second my notes I don't see my notes now mm. okay so um after working by myself for a few years, I mm, founded this small firm and uh, us being small, we do not intend to grow. Us being small allows us customized approach. I feel it's very important to, to treat every student and every family unique way because every family and every student has unique situation. Um, I did hire, however, two associates, so now there are three of us, but I oversee every aspect of their work. 
Now, because I'm not native speaker, uh, I have four editors and writing coaches who help me with essays. So the final polishing of essays uh, are not done by me, but I work with students on um, content. And also, uh, recently, I've been using consultants in case that very specific knowledge of the field is needed. And I am lucky to have contacts in all these wonderful professional fields. So um, why this profession? So we called ourselves educational consultants. And the question is why we even need it and why this lecture is needed and why the whole thing is so confusing. So I tried to put it here on the slide. The admission process is non-transparent to put it mildly. That means you probably know it that people constantly don't understand who got in, who didn't get in. It's impossible to explain and it's becoming more and more impossible to predict. Because It's also very confusing because uh, everything changes every year. It's very confusing. You can't rely on the school approaching it the same way. So because of that, it makes families very nervous. Because family are getting so nervous about the process because it's confusing, the number of application is going up. So the, the more people concerned about unpredictability, the more schools they put on their list. And as a result, uh, it becoming even worse. So it's that's why I put like a vicious cycle here. Um, so what the question is now, what? So that's a little cartoon, which many of my students and many of my families um, tell me that that's exactly how they feel like a labyrinth, hence the name. So, um, okay, I'm all Americans, most American colleges practice what so-called holistic admission. So I put a definition up here on the screen and it's very important to take it to the heart, the meaning of holistic admission. It means that no particular factor can answer the question or can prepare to be a stronger candidate. Every school reserves the right to treat every student as a whole, where a combination of parts does not mean a simple sum. Uh, however, different factors do not play the same role. And that's where it becomes very complicated because every college can choose which factors to give preference over another. Um, I feel that the most misunderstanding between, uh, the most misunderstanding with families is that this, um, many people naturally trying to rely on numbers, uh, especially coming from different culture. Like for example, in my culture, uh, we had the uh, numbers. You have numbers, you passed exam at a certain level and you accept it or not. And um, it, it just doesn't work like this way at all here and uh, that's that's the first factor which is uh, important to acknowledge and kind of make a peace with it that holistic admission it's serious now is it good or bad holistic admission um it, it it's very it's a complex issue i'm not sure that it's it could be positive or negatively evaluated because that makes process non-transparent. Um, schools can admit or not admit anybody they want. They do not have to explain any of their decisions. So that's negative. On the positive side, um, it's forgiving that sometimes 
um, some personal qualities can outweigh grades or some um, bad year could be overlooked uh, because of the character. So it's kind of, it, it has a both, I feel it has both pros and cons. Um, all right, so this is how I am try, trying to explain. So colleges, I know it's not news for you, but I can't emphasize this enough. Colleges are businesses. Uh, it's their businesses. Hence, I put on the left their needs, um, the budget. They need to meet their budget. To meet their budget, they need to admit and make sure they will enroll a certain amount of students. Uh, except for very wealthy school, no university can afford not to have students which bring tuition. So they have to meet, the, they call it enrollment goals, right? This, to meet enrollment goals, uh, they need to have a good yield. Yield simply means that out of the students who were extended offer of admission, what percent of students would take it? You all understand it's very, it's easy to illustrate. Let's say it's, it's a complicated um, models though. Let's say your admission officer and you were your, your dean of admission and you were told to, that your class has to be 1,000 student. So there are ever complex models to predict how many students we have to accept to end up with solvent. Um, so the, and the third one that every college wants to show a diversity. So diversity means everything. Um, they cannot be class full of only engineers. They cannot be class of only um, STEM majors. They cannot be class of all girls or all boys to this matter. So everything, geographical location, interest, talent, suggested majors, uh, all of that matters. So, so admission, when admission committee reviews student applications, they have all of that in mind. They're very concerned about meeting their college needs. So they kind of, they don't consider individual student. They consider how this individual student fit into their needs. That's why I put it, I call it fit. So if we look on the right, that is a student profile. This is what uh, student brings. That's what student application will contain. And you probably kind of know it, but some of some of these categories are less obvious than others. So the first one is the rigor of academic coursework. I think everybody understand that. Uh, there is a term in admissions, it's called most rigorous curriculum available. That means that student chose the hardest classes which were available in his or her school. Uh, admission does look at school, and if, if advanced classes were not available, that is not a student fault. So it's rigor of academic coursework chosen from availability in any given school. Now, grades are self-explanatory, and performance trajectory means that uh, sometimes students getting stronger and stronger as they mature. That's a good trend. It's upward trajectory. Sometimes students are, get, are starting to struggle as harder classes begin. Sometimes they start to struggle because the teenage mind are doing something to them. So it's not just GPA. It's absolutely trajectory and tendency considered in all four years and conclusion are made from this from this view. Test scores, um, 
including SAT and ACT, yes, and uh, AB possibly IB exams. Now, demonstrated interest um, is concept which is not necessarily familiar to everybody, so I'm going to explain it. Um, if you look at the left, then you see the yield again. So uh, college needs wants to know what is the probability of student they accepted will enroll? So their predictive models, the college predictive models, tell them that the more involved student is with college, the more they demonstrate interest in a specific school, the more likely these people to enroll. So some schools say they don't consider demonstrated interest, it is probably not true. I'm sure everybody does to a different degree. Um, but that is that is a factor. Now, recommendations of counselors and teachers and what they reveal about student character are very important and we never get to read them. So it's kind of important factor, but it it remains hidden because there is no access to letters of recommendation. So it's very, it's important to choose um, right people. Leadership and civic engagement is becoming a huge factor. Special talents, passion and interest. Um, again, special talents, passion and interest are not important by themselves, by themselves, but they important if it fit into categories sought by college or university. For example, if university currently is seeking to increase the number of first generation college students, then uh, a person with educated parents do not necessarily fit into this profile. If university is seeking, so uh, again, interest, they should be different. Um, they, if everybody, um, how to say, if everybody playing the same instrument, um, that is, it's becoming not that interesting, again, because of that diversity concept. Um, so it, it could play a role, positive role, or may not, as each of these factors. Special group and circumstances. Um, if the family has, if a student comes from background when they had to struggle a lot, or they had to overcome some physical disability, learning challenges, or was sick for an out of school for a year, parents. Uh, the family broke up, there was a death in the family, any special circumstances through which student persist are uh, also taken into consideration. Special group, it could be alumni, uh, could be recruited athletes, um, could be donors. And of course, gender, culture, race, area, and school also comes into the picture as a, as a college as college needs diversity, because um, again, we can have the whole class of the same people. They really want different di different type of students in everything. So never, even in a very very strong school they will never be more than certain amount of students accepted to the same university. So internal competition is also important. Um, and finally, um, admission also need to believe that student will succeed. So when admission committee is looking Admission, my admission committee at the left of the slide, and they're looking at the student profile, which I kind of try to put together everything about student on the right. There are a lot of thoughts going on. It's a lot of consideration on this admission committee, and they review and change their mind sometimes, few times, till they have this perfect class. 
Uh, all right. So what are we to do as families? Because the picture I am painting is kind of full of uncertainty and it seems like we can't, it's hard, it's challenging to regulate the process. So what I suggest families do, thorough research of colleges and their culture. Colleges have different personality just as people and they do talk about themselves and they do talk about what they're looking for, not directly, but indirectly. And that has absolutely a lot of efforts needs to be put by students, not, I, I would insist it should be students, not necessarily parents, because students should feel that they connecting with school because it's likely that if students understand what school wants, school is a college, what college wants and what type of students they're looking for and what kind of culture there, and student is attracted to this culture, there is more likely college also you'll see that um, attraction. Um, we need to be very clear eyed and pragmatic, uh, assessing student performance, our, our children, chances, performance and chances. So although we can predict uh, a result in one specific school, we can overall kind of know how strong is our student and students have to understand how strong they are and also how strong they are in relations of their class in their high school. Communi communicating with colleges is absolutely crucial because this is how they, ga they gauge demonstrated interest. Uh, we suggest that list should be balanced um, I think most of the people know what reaches target and likely, but I'm going to talk about it a little bit still because some people may not be introduced to the concept yet if they have younger children. So reach is a school which is student is kind of in the bottom, not build, uh, kind of at the bottom of the uh, st accepted student. So your student, our student would be in the lower half, more towards below the middle um, of um, the school criteria. Target and when student is right at the middle um, and likely and when student is above uh, the school requirements. Um, it is becoming increasingly difficult to judge, which we're going to talk next in the next slide, um, because if tests will be optional, the standardized tests and grades were the easy way for us to gauge uh, the student competitiveness. Now, the reason I put wildcard there, because oftentimes I hear from the families that, oh, we just want to apply to this school. Uh, we know there's no many chances, but we just want to try that because we would feel bad if you wouldn't try. That's fine as long as it's one school. I usually recommend no more than one school who just like just just for the for the interest. Uh, I recommend 10 schools. Uh, their tendency, there is more and more. Um, from my experience, it's extremely challenging to put uh, quality, more than 10 quality applications. Uh, of course, there could be schools added, uh, which don't require extra work, but I feel that serious work probably should be, should be put in um, about 10 school. Now, early action, early decision and regular decision. Um, this is what we talk a lot with, uh, about with families. So early decision is binding. What does it mean? That means that school knows that you will enroll. That is a huge plus. So 
every every student can only apply for one early decision because they must go if they admit it. So does it increase chances? Yes, it increases chances hugely a few times. On the other hand, if there is no favorite school or if you want to compare financial packages, it's impossible because early decision, there is nothing to compare. You accept that you have to go. Uh, early action is non-binding. Uh, it's, uh, it's a good way to know your results earlier. Early action, nobody knows whether it increases or decreases chances. It depends on admission policy of the school and what decision they would make this year. It used to be that early action did increase chances to no more because it became so popular. I'm still proponent of few schools early action because it's psychologically much easier for students to have good positive decisions in December while waiting for other decisions to come out in the spring. So um, I, I think that the good formula is few like likely early action to bring comfort that there are some acceptances already and maybe one early decision and then maybe five more um, regular decisions, something like that. But of course, again, it's individual. All depends what kind of school, what kind of student, what family wants and so on. Uh, all right, just one second because I feel, yes. Okay, so um, what is going on now? We are we're really facing a huge transition right now. I would, I would call it seismic changes in admissions because of COVID. So everything I said, still true, only it became worse. It's like uncertainty on steroids because as you probably heard this year, all colleges went test optional. There were few test optional colleges, but not a lot. And all of a sudden, every college in the country is test optional. Um, what does it mean? That means you can submit tests or not. So that sent a lot of families in panic. What do we do if we have scores which are kind of decent, but not as high as you would like them? Do we submit them? Do we hurt the student by not submitting them? It, it, it honestly, this admission cycle was really difficult because of that, because it happened in the middle. Subject SITs are canceled this, as of this week. I got email announcing that they canceled um, two days ago, early in the morning. That is shocking because last year when, uh, so we thought, my entire profession thought that um, our prediction was that as SIT become general SIT may be optional, at least student will be able to submit subject tests to have some indication of their uh, standardized indication of their performance canceled. New requirements are constantly introduced because admissions now they don't have tests, so they want to know more about students. So the number of essays is ever increasing. And it's interesting that sometimes they, they hide this little writing pieces or little portfolio or video introductions, all new stuff within the application. It's not even clear that um, university has these requirements. They keep popping up once you start uh, filling the application. That is a stress, uh, that also puts stress. Next cycle, I'd be absolutely unpredictable. We have no idea what's going to happen next year. Um, we don't know. Uh, test optional will stay. We don't know what's going to happen to subject SIT, which are canceled, but we don't know whether schools will accept SIT's uh, subjects, which already were there. Let's say your child already have to subject test and they did really well. Uh, will they be able to submit it? Uh, don't know, probably some universities will say yes, some no. Um, 
many colleges are under a lot of financial stress uh, because they had to close because of COVID. They lost money on tuition. They lost money on housing fees. Uh, they honestly are freaking out. So um, they uh, they looking for again they're looking for assurance even more than ever that that student uh, will be likely to enroll. Overall enrollment is dropping, but not uh, for all colleges. And uh, for what I observed this year that gap between different schools is continues to grow. And I'll explain what I mean. The wealthiest schools, which huge endowment uh, and very prestigious, not only they didn't see any dip in, in application, they saw a huge increase in application. The schools which are financially strained uh, are trying to give out money to attract people to enroll, which eventually will bring them to bankruptcy. This is doomed financial policy, but that's what they're doing. So there were some people who were able to, there's probably for a couple more years, people will be able to take advantage of um, decent private schools, which are simply afraid to lose their business. So that gap is growing. It's getting easier to get. So it's easy. It's getting easier and easier for students to get into schools which are scared of underenrollment, and it's getting harder to get ever harder to get into top competitive schools. It's kind of, uh, and also more school. So now is used to be that people would say, okay, I'm interested in top 20 school. I would say now it's top 35, at least if not more, became highly sought after. And then the kind of drop, and then there are schools which are scared of under enrollment. Um, all right. So I want to talk a little bit about types of colleges uh, because people like uh, there are so many. There are 4,000 uh, colleges and universities in the United States. That's a lot. So different ways to look at them and categorize them when you starting to think about this list is to think private versus public school are hugely different in price but not necessarily dif different in quality. Uh, as you will see further, some people think of certain schools as private, but they actually in fact public. So colleges versus universities. College means that this is only undergraduate students for four years. There are no graduate programs, nothing else, only undergraduate education. University means it has graduate part. So competitive level. Do not, I, I really don't like people to look at percent of acceptance because I feel it could be misleading. Alex, uh, let me give you an example why. The, some universities are really good at marketing. And you all, I'm sure that my audience are very educated people and you understand how marketing works. If I am able to create more applicants and admit the same size of the class, my acceptance level will be dropping. So the low acceptance level not necessarily means that it's it's harder to get in only in the sense that there are more people applying. So there are schools which are not so well known, absolutely unfairly so. And the, the competitive level is, uh, by so by percent they seem less competitive but if you look at the average scores then you will see that they're absolutely the same the, as hard as others so that also the uh, question of name recognition name recognition is different for different regions different profession different social groups um, I don't know what 
names are popular in which I, I do know some some names which are popular in um, different communities. Uh, for example, uh, for the last two years, I learned a lot about Catholic and Jesuit schools, which one have not been on my radar before that strongly. But I was working with a group of people who really, really <laughs> wanted a religious affiliation for the schools. So for them, um, Loyola College of Maryland or Marist College <clears throat> were well-known schools. And But if you look at the, their small schools, they're private, they're nowhere to be found on the rating. So the name recognition is subjective. Also, um, NYU looms really big, for example, in New York, but maybe not so big on the other coast. Um, uh, spectacular um, colleges such as Panama um, and uh, Claremont McKenna colleges, which are top competitive schools in California, are not even known uh, to the most people on our coast. So it is subjective. Also, the smaller schools, the very competitive small schools, are usually uh, known more to people who work in academia because they see a lot of people who came from there. Um, so small liberal arts colleges versus research universities, when people ask me pros and cons, uh, I would like to explain it this way. Um, it, there is no clear advantage of one over another, right? Because there's so different experience. So let's say I have a student, there's a little story to illustrate that. I have a student who wants to study biology. All right, he wants to study biology and he really wants to do a research in biology. He's not pre-med, he wants to do research in biology. So um, what kind of experience he will have? If he wants, a cutting edge research and world level research lab, then the research university is his target, right? However, in research universities, there are graduate students there to work as professors. So more likely than not, the student will not work directly as faculty. So it will be harder to get recommendation because faculty are much more remote. They have a layer of graduate students recitations or seminar often are led by graduate students. Sometimes lectures are led by graduate students. So professors are focused on research, which means research is of high quality, but undergraduate students, are, it's harder for undergraduate students to be a part of this research and it's harder for them to get closer to the faculty. Now, small liberal arts college, opposite story. Our faculty are invested in teaching. Uh, they promote it based on the quality of their teaching. They get very close to their students. So the letters of recommendations usually are much more meaningful. It's much easier to get your faculty to know you. Uh, classes often based on discussion based and um, it, uh, it, it, it seems for some people it's a better um, choice. It's not a better choice or worse choice, but this is a, a really different atmosphere. And I think it's important to understand. Um, now, some I just threw here some colloquial terms for your entertainment that you wish because people throw them around. So I look for some colloquial terms and Everybody say Ivy League schools, right? So we all know that actually there's only Ivy League schools really not the best schools in the country. It's historical concept. Ivy League is athletic league. That's schools which played football with each other. So they just the oldest and they only on all East Coast. So initially there was seven and then Cornell, which is part Ivy League and part state schools. It's a difficult combination. And Cornell was considered Ivy League too now. Um, you will hear a lot term Ivy Plus. That simply means all schools which just as competitive as Ivy. Uh, 
MIT Stanford Caltech, of course, but a lot of other schools now. Um, Little Ivies, that's I feel that um, usually people know less, they're not well known, they're not that well known unless people went or know somebody who went there because they don't produce the body of research, right? But they do amazing job in educating students. So Little Ivies are most competitive about colleges, so Williams, Honors, Swarthmore, and Middlebury, that type of colleges their numbers are just as high as Ivy League numbers. Uh, it's so hard to, it's very, very hard to get in. Uh, it's extremely rigorous uh, education and it, it, it's, 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 a hard, it's a hard schools to be there. Sometimes people uh, talk about Southern Ivies, like typical is Vanderbilt and Emory um, and public Ivies. So Berkeley and New Michigan and maybe a couple others, it's debatable again, this is no, there's no specific definition, but definitely. So Berkeley is a state school, New Michigan, and probably UCLA also. Public Ivies are just the best public schools. So it, it's, again, the, it's in the eyes of the beholder. But I just wanted to mention that because people do uh, throw around these terms. All right, so um, I um, wanted to address uh, financial matters too. So um, there are need-based financial aid as defined by government. It's based on FAFSA. It works for state colleges. State colleges only use FAFSA. But when families, when families, middle class families, working professional families, usually they feel that they're not entitled to any financial aid. It may or may not be the case. They definitely probably will not be qualified by FAFSA, by government. Uh, uh, guidelines. But the second type of need-based financial aid is by criteria of private colleges. Private colleges do not have to comply with government um, guidelines. They define who needs to pay what by themselves based on very long and very tedious form called CSS. Um, so private schools require both FAFSA and CSS, and they ask about everything. Um, now, merit scholarships from uh, from colleges, sometimes referred to tuition discount, but colleges don't like that. But you see why we would think of them as a discount, because colleges are trying to attract people. So merit scholarship awarded by private and state schools, and they do not depend on family income. They solely depend or on desire or financial calculation of the school. So the average size this year of married aid, of married scholarship for my students is between 20, between for private schools between 15 and 27,000 a year per year. So it's a considerable um, considerable sum of money. Um, so by over four years, it's over 100,000. Uh, but that's also, of course, schools where cost of attending will be climbing to 70,000 a year. There are colleges which do not award merit scholarship, merit scholarships. Uh, that's most competitive schools. They do not award merit scholarships, Ivy Plus. They say that um, uh, everybody who they accept is already outstanding and they consider only need. So they need based only. Um, but that's always clearly stated on their website. So that is 
one thing which is not confusing schools clearly state whether they um, need based only or they would consider merit scholarships i couldn't resist to put this uh, uh little joke um because we found it when uh, my own daughter was applying and uh, we were asking for some aid and uh, you see what it says it says that, right that dean has gone over your financial statement and he doesn't think you're working up your potential that's how need-based <laughs> might work um Okay, so I, uh, when we were discussing this presentation, I suggested that I spend a little time on specifically um, early assurance BSMD programs. So um, uh, I'm gonna talk about them shortly. Actually, actually there's not, not much to talk because I put everything on the screen. Um, there is advantage and disadvantages and if you have question about it later, I can definitely um, answer them. Um, it's a very personal decision, but it's it's not necessarily um, straight best or sweetest deal again because because of disadvantages you can see here. Um, so, if again, if you have questions more specifically about it, then um, by all means. So, yes, and uh, this BSMD programs or any early assurance, early entrance programs. Um, consider again grades choice of classes test scores it's all the same but plus it has to be research experience volunteer activities in health field physician shadowing leadership and specific recommendation and if uh because student is accepted directly into medical school so admission wants to see intelligent compassionate and absolutely they want to see a mature person it's very important because uh they don't want people to drop out and it's very hard it's 17 years old to make such a long commitment so they want to make sure that people are emotionally mature enough to make this commitment and to understand what physician profession entails all right so now where to start? I feel that I will be repeating some things, but that's it's it's all the same concept. We're, like we are facing this uncertainty, we have students at different levels. So where do we start? We have to start with evaluating what's going on, what student wants, what their potential maturity level. We need to discuss what family wants. Family usually have goals for their students. Different family give their students different degree of freedom. It, absolutely, if any of you have juniors, I would recommend to start choosing teachers for recommendations. Recommendations has to be from 11th grade. 10th grade doesn't work. Um, and you cannot wait for 12th. So it has to be 11th grade. So for those of you who have juniors, it's very important. It's also very important to get to know your guidance counselor. Even though guidance counselor are overworked and sometimes people complain that they don't have time, they will make time if you, um, if you are active enough. Regardless of what else help you getting, the main letter of recommendation will be written by guidance counselor. So they have to know a student. Um, it falls on us, on, on our students, to make sure that guidance counselor knows about their aspirations. And it's very important to listen to what guidance counselor says also about their chances, because guidance counselor has a unique expertise, unique knowledge of this particular school, which colleges they usually do well, which colleges they usually don't do well, and things like that. Um, review extracurricular activities. 
So our children, um, all my colleagues agree that our children do too much. Um, so it's more important. Depth is much more important than breadth. So if a person is a, goes to 10 different clubs and uh, it, it is not believed, uh, it will not be believed that is a serious commitment. Um, so reviewing these things and focusing is very important. Um, I had an unfortunate example of that last year with one of my absolutely star students and uh, have we spoke with him and his family earlier, um, I think it would be different because he did not participate in any, uh, he, he's mathematically gifted, but he did not participate in mathematical Olympiads in, um, he did not participate in competitions because simply he was doing too much. Uh, as a result, he did not have um, things to show which by his gift, would be good to show. So depth very important. Commitment is very important. Three years is better than uh, three years is important. Two years, four years, commitment and growing that uh, level of responsibility. So the ideal situation is if student is interested in something and for example it's a club then eventually they would grow into leadership position in this club because they've been there for a while it doesn't mean people can't try new things if they really want but uh, uh families and students have to think uh really really um well how much importance is key club where everybody is a member of key club how important is owner society where everybody is owner society i mean it's okay but every other application will have the same so summer is important uh summer plans should be discussed whether you have sophomore or uh, junior summer is important but it doesn't mean that summer has to be overloaded with academic stuff sometimes simple work uh, for, for, for money, for a little paycheck, um, just doing some standard um, high, high school type kids job um, is evidence of maturity and also that the kid is not sheltered. So it doesn't matter what uh, a child on family choose to do, not a child now, a student or family choose to do, but it's really important that they you don't do nothing at all. Um, uh, I mean, they can, if, if they do nothing, then they should read books. Then they, they would say, okay, I decided this summer I will be reading books um, and become, I will be able to talk about these books. It, this, it, the development just doesn't stop in the summer. Right. Uh, it's important to start thinking about characteristics of the colleges and which are important for your student, your family. Uh, these characteristics are not necessarily the same. Sometimes students are telling me that they want to go to California and parents want them in within three hours drive. Uh, and sometimes it's vice versa. And sometimes everybody agree. But what characteristics it so it's important to start talking and kind of finding a middle ground. I also think that because it comes, one of the uh, factors which come to that is discussing a degree of the independence making choices. Will they apply where their parents will tell them they apply? There are very different, there are different relations and different degree of independence in different families. Um, and uh, after that kind of some names start occur, then a family can plan visit and now student can start attending virtual events. It's actually, uh, on one hand, it's uh, too bad that we can't visit uh, campuses in person because physical impression of campus is very important. On the other hand, it's great that they can do virtual information session and start connecting with schools before family can plan actual to travel. So it falls on the student now 
these virtual sessions really teach them to do research. It's less of emotional uh, impact of beautiful college campus, but there is a more of serious research going on. And I, I really encourage um, to do that. So this is starting place. Now, the, the, the other question, because I said where to start, but I kind of hear, although I don't hear questions, but I kind of hear a question in my mind, when to start, right? And this is really, there is no one recipe, it depends on the child. Um, so I would like to talk a little bit about teenage psychology or psychology. So personality matters. You may have, you and your child can have similar personality or different personality, but all these parameters, which could come with any grades and any success, um, it's very, very important. Uh, I had, um, I've seen uh, sophomores who can't wait to start this process. And I also observe juniors who feel it's too early and it makes them, um, make them nervous because this process seems too overwhelming. So I feel that um, all that, your personality, your child personality and uh, how ready they are, how willing they are, are really, really important. Um, I am not um, in favor of pushing this process earlier than a student is ready, because I feel that when they get overwhelmed, it, it the process is just not not a positive process for them. I, in spite of entire. Um, confusion and unpredictability. I really love that. I love working on admission process because I view it as um, I view it as a chance to watch a young person developing and exploring who they are. It's very gratifying. They mature right in front of my eyes. And when I see them, uh, and you will see that too in your children, you will see how they will change drastically from even from junior year, for one year, they keep this age of such a dramatic and fast development and changing. So some will of a sudden would wake up in summer and will be and will do everything in two months. Possible, very possible. And some would like to and some think about about colleges from uh, seventh grade. Um, very, very different. So I don't have um, like, I don't have necessarily recommendation. I, it really depends. I usually think that ninth grade is a little early unless, uh, it's a student who really, really considering a direct admission into medical school. Um, otherwise, uh, juniors and sophomores are fine, depending how they, um, depending where they are developmentally, developmentally and maturity wise. And uh, finally, uh, I have some thoughts about reducing the stress. So I call on you parents, <laughs> because I know it was very hard for me. Um, to adjust the process of the personality we just discussed. So do not repeat my mistakes, which I did with my first child, and do not make a culture favorite topic of dinner conversation. Try not to talk too much about who got where in your community. It's very popular, especially in my I mean, in my Russian immigrant community, that's all people are talking about. So and so got into this Ivy League. So and so got into this Ivy League. It's very hard for children to keep hearing that. It's hard for us to. We should tune it out. Um, we should emphasize fit over prestige and ranking again because prestige and ranking does not mean the child will have a great experience, and also it doesn't mean they will be successful. Um, my mm, the one of my student when. To, just to give you one example, one of my students went to University of Delaware. Um, she was not very academically a serious in high school, went to University of Delaware. 
started to get more and more focused, graduated on top of her class, and now she's um, at Stony Brook Medical School. Um, so, the, and nothing in her um, 11th grade performance uh, kind of, uh, it would, I would not predict that that's the way it would develop, right? So they keep developing, but it was perfect fit. It gave her time and not too stressful situation where she started to thrive, uh, gain confidence and took it off from there. Um, Open-ended questions are good. Um, what do you like about this? Blah, blah, blah. Um, try to listen to your child, especially when you're driving them somewhere. So when personal college visits were still possible, I think the best impression of the way our children feel would be when they start talking in the car after the visit. That was the best. And hopefully you guys still be able to do that. Um, and sometimes people have somebody else to keep track because they don't want to get into this tension with their children. So that's the, the uh, gist of what I wanted to put out there. And I'm open to any questions you have. Hello? And, uh, with questions, you can um, unmute yourself and ask questions. To the viewers, we have uh, almost 39 people. At one point, we had more than 40. Right. If anybody has a question, please unmute yourself and ask the question. Yeah, I'm sure there got to be questions because it's very hard to put information which is like people people have different situations so please throw it me yeah. hi uh this is a question um my name is palani uh, uh -huh. i just want what kind of services you provide um uh, from your side uh to enable kids to get into colleges etc i'm sorry what what kind of services do you provide uh, to help kids get into college what I am that person, the last bullet on the last slide, who keep them on track instead of parents. Everything. We choose college list. We discuss their visits, uh, help them with drafting, the, discussing their essays, everything which needs to be done, the entire process. Or sometimes... Um, People just want to sit and have this initial evaluation of how their child stand, of the potential and where we are and what the strategy, instead of long commitment, that's two. And the third version is the last uh, application, the senior year, the application process. I don't like that, but I do it sometimes too. We, uh, because at this point, it's... Uh, kind of difficult to fix things which were done, right? So, uh, but I think initial initial evaluation and consultation is one of the favorite things for families, I feel, to do. And then some families prefer a long-term commitment and we are together for two, from three to one year, uh, depending where they start. Did I answer? Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's what I want to know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I will read it from the YouTube link. Is the process same for masters or would it be different? I'm sorry? Is the process same for masters or would it be different? Oh, no. I feel it's a very, very different process um, because masters, the graduate schools are still reasonable. It's not a wild game. People go to graduate school for certain reason. This is not undecided situation anymore. See, because for the most part, I mean, you can choose major, you can apply for undergraduate level to school of engineering. But for the most part, 
a lot of schools, especially competitive schools, they don't even ask you to choose a major. You don't have to choose major till third year. So it's wide open. You choose school. It's American tradition for undergrad education. You don't choose a profession. You choose a school, right? Vacation. What is that's why so much conversation about their culture. Master's degree is very different. This is a professional training. So I feel it's much more reasonable. Uh, I, it's predictable. It's reasonable. It's focused. Students are more mature. I like this work because it's less volatile. It's very focused, different, yes. And, and statement of purpose. <clears throat> you don't have to, with master's degree, you don't have to write weird essays anymore. You write about why you want this degree for your profession. So it's very, it's really straightforward. And nothing about undergraduate education is straightforward. I'm sorry? How do we get in touch with you? Well, it's a link on my website. You can send me a message. Hi. Um, do uh, I just have a question regarding the college essay? Uh huh. Is it a uh, same essay for all the colleges, or is there any specific topic? Do you help out uh, writing the college essays for the students? Excellent. Thank you for this question. Thank you. I I knew that there was uh, something I'm not uh, putting out there. So uh, it will be very long answer. Ready? <laughs> it's a long answer because it's impossible to answer shortly. So there is a thing which called common app. Have you heard about that? Um, no. So Co common app is a soft. Common app is a one online. A form which many colleges use, but not all of them. That's where it becomes complicated, right? Many, many colleges use Common App. So Common App, you write one main essay in Common App. And then each college throws at you as many supplemental essay as they want. And that's what I was referring to when I said requirements are ever increasing. Up to six short supplemental, short, long, short questions. So the answer is yes, the main essay is the same, but no supplemental essays could be very different. And the number is overwhelming. My, uh, my, uh, the record is held for my by my student from the last year who wrote 70, 70 essays. He counted them. How about that? Wow. Yeah, I know. But also to make the story worse, that's not the end of the story. To, uh, to make the story worse, some colleges do not take common application. For example, University of California system doesn't. So if you're applying to Berkeley, uh, you have to do all separate application. But on the other hand, if you decide to apply to California system, then I would apply to few schools because then they are the same. So University of California has a separate application system, but at least it's the same system for all UC schools. So UCLA, UC Berkeley will not be different. So. Yes, we help with essays. That's what we do starting from July to, um, I. it's really overwhelming. If people are applying to competitive colleges, the number of things they have to write is really overwhelming. So we want to start in July and we want to finish in December. But in July, usually July and August, you want to finish main essay, and then all the supplements will come. You are talking about the eleventh grade summer, right? Yes, eleventh grade summer. So the application is a common app. Um, the common app essay comes out topics, prompts. They come out July first, usually. 
So, I mean, we can assume that they would be the same, but we're not sure till we see them. So we see them on July 1st, confirmed that what this is the topics for this year. And universities are also supposed to release their supplementals by July 1st. Because, so, so the trick is that even though this year I knew all the prompts which were there, I, I, U Chicago did, did not promise that they wouldn't change anything. You know, nobody promised anything. They can do whatever they want. There are no regulations. They're private agencies, so there are no regulations. Private schools are more infamous for putting more and more essays. Usually, public, uh, public universities, state colleges are better. There are less essays. Their applications are uh, better, unless it's UC. UC application is very difficult. There's a lot of essays. You are based at California? No, I'm based on Long Island. But my students are applying to University of California all the time. So I know UC system very, very, because we're applying there all the time. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Some students want, want to go, as they say, as far from home as they can. Yes. <laughs> They're looking for me. Uh, there was one went <laughs> from uh, New Jersey from, from our family and he ended up staying there. Doesn't want to come back. <laughs> right. But sometimes it's, it's nothing negative. Some people just more adventurous by nature. That's what I feel, right? They just want something. And California has this call. Everybody wants to California. And also, it's so those of my students, I have students who wants to be next to Silicon Valley. That's where they want to be. So, and then Berkeley is like Stanford is yep. I mean, all but impossible. Then Berkeley comes next. <laughs> yeah. But do out of state uh, students have some privileges? I mean, say, for example, student from East Coast are playing in California. Uh, is there any advantage? Student from East Coast applying in California, no advantage. But student from uh, East Coast applying to Iowa is more unusual. So there is an advantage. Uh, why is that? Because it's unusual. Whatever uh -huh. is, so you competing, so Every time you're competing with the same type of students you are, right? Let's say, uh, uh, so uh, if, if you're applying to somewhere where less traditional, then you're more interesting because there's a less people like you. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I make sense. I'll try to give you an example. Um, I mean, every school, every school usually has popular colleges, right? Popular colleges. For example, my uh, I have students from uh, Stuyvesant, from New York City, right? From special school, from Stuyvesant, Bronx Science, Staten Island, and Brooklyn Tech. All of them. Uh, they have popular. Each of them have different popular top school, right? For example, Bronx Science, massively applying to University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. They love University of Michigan, and University of Michigan loves them. So again, I can't answer you. So on the one hand, it's a school which loves them, but on the other hand, they're still not going to take more than 20. They're not going to take 150 who are applying, right? Yeah. But then, but they will take more than two. They will take 20 or 25. The school, public school where I live, um, loves Cornell and Cornell loves them. So every year, Cornell takes 15 to 19 applicants, uh, students from the school. Uh, but uh, never, never less, never more. But again, it's hard to say, is it advantage to apply to, to school, which is pop, to college, which is popular with your school? Yes and no. Yes, because this college loves your school. But no, because there are a lot of people applying and you create an internal competition. So if you apply to California, a less known school, then yes, you're at advantage. But if you're applying to Stanford, the answer is no. Okay. Okay, Elena, this is Jude. Uh, thank you for the details. Just a follow up to the this previous question, right? So you said um, candidates applying to a college in Iowa has a better outcome than in California. So I, I just want to get a little bit more details around that. So 
is the what is the role of race and ethnicity into the um, admission process is okay. there so uh, it's the same as geographical location i want so admission committee is tasked with forming class not a student in their mind they are admitting the best possible class not the combination of best possible students do you hear the difference not really okay the best possible class will have the most diversity mm -hmm. but best possible students could be not diverse at all they yeah. could be all asians or all jewish or i don't know whatever mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right but yeah. best possible but best possible class needs to be best diverse so it needs representation of so they consider race yes and if you guys i don't know if any of you i can send it as a follow up uh, if you were following harvard lawsuit mm -hmm. about discriminating of asian of chinese americans right um, that is very interesting lawsuit because harvard won and uh, the decision was made that yes, private school does have a right to consider any factors they want, including race. Because if they don't consider race, they may end up with very non-diverse class. But do they set their own benchmark? Um, the colleges, we need to apply certain percentage of diverse candidates. I'm sorry? Do they set their own benchmark in terms of diversity, the colleges in general? Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So typically what percentage is that? Do you have that kind well, of? Nobody knows that. This okay. is uh, between, nobody can possibly know that. There's, a, there's at some point leadership of college meets with Dean of Admission and say, this year we have this priority. That may be different priority, different year. Yeah. For example, this year, uh, this year, uh, all colleges really wanted to accept first-generation college students. That was a trend, mm -hmm. right? First generation, with that means parents who were not college educated. So they were trying to bring more of them. What exactly number they have, I don't. We would never know. And we also don't know if it's rigid numbers or they're kind of flexible. I, I feel that they're kind of flexible number. But yes, each group is uh, uh, competing with itself. So within itself, there, there is an, it's not quota, but there is a sense of, and the same with majors. They will never accept class of everybody who wants to be uh, computer science or electrical engineer. They won't. They need English majors, they need poets, right? They need musicians, they need all kinds of different people, people who want to study history. For university to survive and to continue to be university, they want all kinds of different people. It's the same, the race is the same as interest, the same as geographical location. Everything is a piece of diversity concept. That class, they want class of people very different who will mix up with each other because the concept, the philosophical concept that pe uh, uh, the philosophical concept underlying that is that people are mutually enriched if they're different. Thank you. Um, I have a question regarding the college acceptance. Uh, my daughter goes to charter school uh, uh -huh. where there is uh, not much, uh, many clubs or not many extracurricular activities. So do the college consider the application from students go to charter school differently? Uh, do they know that about the clubs and everything? I hear that they treat that different, the charter schools. Uh, yes, it's a good question. So uh, your question has two parts. Do, school, do colleges consider what school child comes from? Absolutely, yes. This is a, they get a um, description of the school. They know statistics. Uh, and the guidance council explains everything they need to be explaining. Yes, they do consider schools. However, if uh, it, does it mean that the person cannot get involved? No. 
it, it, people, uh, students can get involved outside of uh, school. School clubs are not that necessary because there are a lot of different other things people can do. Right? Yeah, we are doing it from outside, but um, just from school, uh, there is not much. So do I need to worry? That's my question. You don't need to worry. No, to the contrary. Outside is more impressive than in school. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because it means initiative outside of school. It's much easier just to go to the club than come up with something outside. So no, you don't have to worry about that. And how about the volunteering, um, uh, the importance of volunteering this year? Um, due to pandemic, there is not much opportunities. So do they... Uh, consider that yes absolutely this year as never before the concept of citizenship and civic engagement which volunteering is a part of is important because you don't have test scores so if you don't have test scores we have to think of intangibles as character motivation right so volunteering is important as a part of this character or citizenship or involvement. Okay. I know okay. there is a few opportunities, but it, it also depends whether, are you talking about volunteering for somebody who is considering health related profession or just volunteering as an act of goodness? Are you talking I about mean, health? I mean, no, general volunteering uh, uh, in e events for the community, mm. voluntary hours. I there, hear from parents that they need minimum of certain voluntary hours. Uh, when they this, the I course. mean, the, uh, we are talking about we are talking about different level of involvement. Hours is not what college is looking at. Okay. It's the not level of involvement is expected. You will have to, your child, your children, if they apply to competitive schools, and even in many state schools, in many less competitive schools now, they will be asked to write essays about what they did and why did they do it. So it is the meaning for them of what they do is more important than ours. So if they can't explain what's the meaning, ours will not help. It's a, it's a meaning of why they're doing it. How, what is their, why is it important? What did they learn from that? Okay. All right. So, um, right. For example, um, um, I have a student who is, um, I mean, there's a bit, there's a lot. So there's so many different examples, some people doing. So I have a student who is volunteering. There are a lot of students are teaching uh, tutoring on the privileged kids in other school districts online. It's possible to do it online. There some students are doing because they're environmentally concerned. They are cleaning. They're becoming found organizations which do some uh, environmental project of cleaning or recycling. So it, it there are some people deliver food to homeless shelters. There's a lot of different things people do, but um it um it again it's not necessarily that important for so state schools i don't know what will happen with state schools next year because years before traditional state schools were leaning on numbers more than they were leaning on all this uh soft factors Right. And okay. private schools were leaning on soft, all these very competitive schools have to lean on everything because everybody who is applying are too strong. But um, at, uh, for example, this year, if you were applying to Bennington uh, and you had um, Bennington, which is very good school in my opinion, but they didn't ask for supplemental essays and uh, they just, uh, and uh, all my students who submitted scores of 1400 all got accepted. So uh, it was not regardless of 
how active they were or weren't. So it really varies. But some schools, like you would know when you read their website, you would know. For example, if you read Bo Boston College, right, or Fordham, then they would say, we are Jesuit school. And for us, serving is the most important thing in a human character. And you know that they will be asking you essays about serving and service and volunteering and giving back. Because they say the school is based on these values and that's what's important for us. Hello, uh, this is Ranga. I'm from New York, Tamil Sangam. Uh, New York, I'm sorry, you from where? Uh, New York, Tamil Sangam. He was, he, was, uh, he was the ex-president of New York, Tamil Sangam. Uh -huh. Yeah. So our, our organization also gives out, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, volunteering opportunities for, uh, you know, uh, as, as children. So uh, uh, once they perform their voluntary uh, services, we give out recommendations or uh, letters of their voluntary service. Uh, I hope that also helps. Uh, well, it totally helps. Uh, I know one of the students who did that, and I read uh, a wonderful essay about connecting to Tamil roots. So yes, yes, right. absolutely. It's really great that you're doing it. It helps a lot because it's also, it gives them sense of community. It gives them true connection and they can write about it and you can write a letter of recommendation it's very very helpful i'm i'm so happy to know that you're doing it sure thank you there will be one more question uh, does your college saving plan impact merit-based scholarships i'm sorry does your college sa saving plan impact merit-based scholarships I'm sorry, I, if I don't know. If someone has a college savings account going, and when they- oh, No, no, go, no, savings- Does it affect merit base? Sa savings do not impact merit scholarships, no. So when they when do they apply for merit scholarship exactly? Is it uh, after they take the SATs? Is it in 11th grade or? They don't apply for merit scholarship. It's a college way, colleges, some merit scholarship you have to apply, but many of them you don't have to apply. They consider you for merit just as you, you're submitting your regular application and they consider you for merit. But some colleges, you're right. Some colleges would say, ah, we accept you now we apply for this and they throw two more essays on you after your application is submitted, but never before. Okay. Mm -hmm. But many, many, most colleges, many, many colleges would consider they, your application is application at the same time for merit. Um, some, yeah. Right now, it's it's going pretty well this year. I I see money and money and money from for my students. It's really um, except for uh, top schools who need based only, so there are no money there. But everybody else has been generous this year. Okay, if we have to get in touch with you, um, exactly when would that be? Uh, in eleventh grade summer or? Well, I thought I already answered this question. It depends on your child and what you want to do. So if um, some people like to start earlier, I have sophomores. Some people like to do it uh, summer. I mean, summer, in the summer, people could, uh, it's too late to fix anything, right? So summer is just an application. There's nothing else. It's very late. Uh, so it's just an application reading and checking. Uh, so and do, do they work with you or you have uh, many uh, people in your... Uh... I do have two people. I have two associates, but I do prefer... Uh, I am um, trying not to take people at the end. Because usually what happens at the end, you're already full, right? So it's very hard with somebody all of a sudden comes at the summer. So I would do its opposite. 
if 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 anybody has a junior and they want to talk about it i would talk as it is just one time get all the information you want to get look at their scores look at their grades look at the extracurricular activities and then you can make a decision you can do it yourself or you can come back at the end but at the end there's a chance that it may be not just not not enough time honestly okay. uh, this this year i so i i think that uh the right point of contact would be uh when child is ready to talk, when a, when your student is and you are ready to talk about this process, about strategy, like in the beginning of the strategy rather than the at the end. Okay, so once they start with you, it's weekly once, or how how will you sit with them for college essays? Is it a particular slot you give? I'm sorry. I mean, is it a particular slot timing you meet with them uh, for college essays? This is a specific question. I don't know if it's interesting for everybody, but it's uh, it all depends. I can't tell you because if person if uh, uh, writing seventy essays or five, that's a big difference how we work. If person applying for most competitive school, how many schools, what type of school, that's very different. That's why I'm saying that initial evaluation is more important to know where you stand and what the goals will be. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It was a very informative Dr. session. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Polaneva and uh, New York Tamil Changam. Greatly appreciate your uh, um, uh, session today. And uh, um, if uh, someone wanted to contact, uh, can you just uh, give us your email address so that people can contact you? If, yes, of course I can give them my email, but also I have a direct uh, access to contact on my website. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, I can I can give you email. Would you want me to type? I'll send it to. Just put that uh, slide that where they can reach and uh, so that people can note down and then. Right. I believe that I. I mean, we were when we were arranging that. Yes. Where do you want me to do it? Because uh, there, right there, and people can note it down. Where you where they can reach you. Yeah. Right. Um, the first do one. Want, do you want me to put it on the slide or where? No, I mean uh, the company name that you have that I believe. Yes, it's all was on, it oh, all right. was on, on the wonderful flyer yeah. somebody did. It's all there. Okay. CollegeplusCareer.com is the um, yes. yeah. so you can Yeah, just that's pretty that easy. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think uh, this will be the end of the session and uh, uh, we, will, we prefer to have uh, more sessions if it needed based on popular demand um, and hope uh, everyone had a informative uh, session and uh, thank you very much thank you so much for having me i hope at least it gets some basic information why is it <laughs> why is it so stressful right yes yes so they can discuss with you for an in-depth <laughs> analysis exactly I be, I'm sure people have a lot of individual questions. Yes. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're this very welcome. The end Thank of you the very much. I'm Thank really you all honored. for listening also. Okay. I'm very honored. Thank you. Good night from New York, Thomas Good night. How do I go from here? Thank you. Thank you very much.